Did you know that the design of the bicycle today has largely been the norm for over a century? A hundred years, we've been riding bikes with two identically sized wheels and chain drive. And since the 1800s, people have enjoyed this affordable mode of transportation. And yet, it wasn't until decades after the bike was invented that mathematicians and physicists started trying to figure out scientifically, how does a bike actually work? The early designers didn't have proof, no data. They just had creative ideas that they tested, trialed, failed, tried again, and ultimately succeeded at coming up with something improbable, perhaps even illogical. If you've ever tried to convince a client to try a new marketing campaign that admittedly sounded a little crazy, you know how hard it is to get buy-in for the creative ideas without any data. So what do you do? That's what we're covering in today's episode of Agency Accelerated. Welcome back to Agency Accelerated, the show for agencies who want to get bigger. So stick with us to learn how you can simplify your growth strategy with practical tips from the marketing pros. So if we haven't met, I'm Stephanie Liu and I'm here in beautiful, sunny San Diego. Those of you watching right now, and I see you, <laughs> let us know where you're tuning in from in the comments. I'd love to see your name pop up and give you a great shout out. And PS, by the way, if you're watching the replay, comment with hashtag replay. Those who watch and engage live will have the amazing opportunity to get their questions answered in real time. So as a reminder, we're live every other Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, 11 a.m. Pacific on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and of course, LinkedIn. Make sure you head on over to agorapulse.com forward slash calendar and subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes. And remember, stay until the very end because you'll get a chance to get your hands on a creative way to grow and scale your marketing agency. So having said that, shout out to the crew that is here. I am so excited that you are here because we are absolutely going to geek out. Now, I can't wait to get into today's topic simply because of the fact that you know how much I love psychology. But here's the thing. While the general consensus in marketing today is to be data-driven in all that we do, there is a problem inherent in the data. It's all about the past. But what if we're trying to pitch a prospect or a client on a marketing idea? That's something about the future, right? We need to be able to predict consumer behavior, behavior that's often illogical and nonsensical. And so that's exactly what our guest today is going to talk to us about. It's going to be fun. Grab your notebooks. Rory Sutherland is the vice chairman of Ogilvy and the founder of The Behavioral Practice, an arm of the globally recognized ad agency that explores the psychology and unseen opportunities in consumer behavior. Those are often small contextual changes which can have enormous effects on the decisions people make. For instance, tripling the sales rate of a call center just by adding a few sentences to the script? Put another way, lots of agencies will talk about bought, owned, and earned media. Rory, on the other hand, will look for invented media, discovered media, seeking out those unexpected and inexpensive contextual tweaks that transform the way that people think and act. Hey Rory, welcome to the show. How you doing? Hello, absolute pleasure to be on. I was also fascinated by the conversation about bicycles, by the way. Um, uh, you're absolutely right that they invented the bicycle before physicists knew how it worked. And there is still some debate among physicists as to how a bicycle stays up, upright, what is the gyroscopic role in keeping it stable. And um, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing. It's, it's rather like that famous thing, which is that uh, scientists proved that a bumblebee couldn't fly. 
<laughs> and evolution had effectively come to a solution which what you might call sequential logic could never reach. The bicycle was a bit weird, actually. It actually had an extraordinary evolutionary leap with a thing called the Rover Safety Bicycle in the 19th century, which was produced by a company, I think, in Coventry called Rover, which later made cars. I mean, it doesn't exist anymore, but they, they became a car company. But this safety bicycle with the two identical sized wheels is pretty much identical to the modern bicycle. And yet uh, the company more or less came up with it. Um, it was one of those things where you, you know how evolution moves both either very slowly or very fast. This was genuinely a case of a very, very fast leap forward by making the wheels the same size, by having <laughs> effectively the gearing going to the back wheel. All those things happened at once. Yeah. It's quite interesting. I know this, by the way, for a very weird reason, which is... <laughs> I'm not, no, I, I'm, okay. I'm not I love I'm not all these things. No, I'm not you're, a big you're... fan. Of, a very weird reason, which is reading a reading a strange passage on the internet on the internet, which actually exists. There's a book called Woodrow Wilson and Bicycling, and it reveals that Woodrow Wilson was a massive fan of this Rover um, safety bicycle, and actually massively um, opposed to the car in the early stages of the 20th century. He thought that the car was leading to basically socialistic feeling in the United States because people resented rich people driving around so much that it was mm. actually in danger of creating a kind of socialist or Marxist revolution. And of course, Henry <laughs> Ford then comes along two years later and changes the game. But the, yeah. reason, the reason I found that out is very weird, which is um, there are several members of my family, both my mother's and father's family, emigrated to the United States, and a few relatives have kind of tracked down the genealogy. And the four people we've managed to trace are a former Miss South Carolina, okay, which is uh, Miss Teen South Cal Carolina, actually, which I imagine is quite a highly contested field. Um, there's a guy who was a horseback rider in Buffalo Bill's Wild West Circus. OK, there's a guy who's now in prison for um, abduction and attempted murder. And there's Woodrow Wilson. OK, so the, those are the four people we're related to in the United States. So if you believed in kind of genetic determinism before, I think you can kind of abandon it now. But um, oh no, uh, I ended up because I was researching this, I ended up reading, to be honest, for longer than was healthy, a whole screed about Woodrow Wilson and his bicycling adventures. Uh, he actually went back to Scotland looking for his ancestors, who are my father's father's mother's ancestors, but never managed wow. to find them because they moved to Wales uh, in between. So there we go. Narrowly missed having a bicycling visit from Woodrow Wilson in the family. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. So everyone, right off the bat, my gosh, we are, you know that we're going to have a lot of fun. I mean, as far as like history quizzes and all the different things. In fact, Rory, yeah. we were just talking about this. I would love to know your take on the recent wordle craze that swept the internet. Because in alchemy, you equated human behavior to cryptic crosswords, which we also talked about. Yeah. And here we've had countless human beings participating and then sharing their crossword fanaticism. Like, what do you think that is? It's really, it's really, really interesting. Um, uh, the popularity of Wordle is fascinating because it is a kind of perfect game in a way. You mostly succeed. Uh, you can, if you want to, get really, really technical about it. And I imagine there are a whole bunch of people who've uh, eff effectively, uh, you know, started to do kind of algorithmic Wordle solving. But it's it's a game of a beautifully short length. Um, it's um, a game which involves kind of. Uh, I suppose, an initial guess and then constant refinement. I don't know, and I'm genuinely curious about this. The New York Times has bought it. We genuinely don't know whether it'll be a flash in the pan or whether it'll be an enduring uh, hobby. And it's a very, very difficult thing to tell because it, it, the crossword has endured a, a surprisingly long time. Uh, and when you think about it, the crossword is a particularly beautiful um, form of uh, puzzle because some of the clues are, are too difficult probably for you to solve without a few of the letters filled in and so the brilliant thing with the crossword is that um, uh, you know you have this wonderful thing of a few of the clues are easy and that might give you one or two of the missing letters you know from uh, a much more difficult clue and so the way in which you fill in a crossword is very, very interesting. And also the way which I think is very similar to creative problems, which is you can kind of solve it two ways. You can either use the clue to generate the word 
or you can work out what the word has to be and then effectively reverse engineer why the clue um, actually pertains to that word. And I always, think, I always think when you do when you solve problems creatively, in a weird way, there are two directions in which you can do it. You can do it sort of from the top down and you can do it from the bottom up. And sometimes it is this case where you just think of something. I, mean, I think all creative people will recognize this. Yeah. You think of something, you go, well, that's really interesting, but why? And effectively, yeah. what you've effectively got to do is post-rationalize. And by the way, I think I, I've got to, I'm going to make this point. There's nothing wrong with post-rationalizing. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes actually a lot of great science, you know, penicillin was really that strange. Why are all these bacteria dying? Ooh, look, there's a bit of fungus. What's going on there? And, that, you know, if if something really interests you, don't go, well, I don't know how I got here, so therefore my insight is invalid. If you've got a well-honed creative instinct, what you do is you, you, you learn to notice when one of those insights has happened. Yeah. And then what you can do is you go backwards and you effectively say, why might that be interesting? It's obviously been solved by my subconscious. You know, I've solved this in some way by my subconscious. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what has my subconscious managed to attain which I can't attain through sequential rational logic. And then it's the time to build the logical framework, if you like, uh, to support your idea, but you actually build the supports after you've actually reached the summit. It's, it, it's really, really interesting. I, I, find, I find that kind of fascinating. I, 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 I always get very cross when people say, yeah, that's a post-rationalization. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> I, okay? You know, I mean, you know, that, that in some ways is, is actually what a great creative idea is. It's a kind of a leap of insight or inspiration, which is then subsequently post-rationalized. Yeah. Um, so and, and there's a great piece about this, about ideas referring to Archimedes in the bath, which is the way Archimedes would write it up in a scientific paper is, I realized that to calculate the volume of the crown, I would need a volume of liquid where the volume of liquid displaced by the crown would be equal to the volume of the crown. So with a suitable man, but he didn't actually come to the idea that way. He came to the idea by sitting in the bath and noticing that the water flowed over the sides. Mm. Now you need a particular mind to actually make the connection between climbing into a bath and measuring the volume of a crown. And probably it's a pretty well prepared mind. Mm -hmm. So I'm not suggesting everybody can do this, but nonetheless, I'm pretty happy. There's a guy called Paul Feyerabend who wrote a book called Against Method. And I do generally subscribe to an anything goes view of making progress in advertising ideas. OK, I, I think, to be honest, everybody, everybody knew in advertising back in the 70s. It wasn't really a process. OK, sometimes you got lucky. Sometimes you went <laughs> down a dead end and had to effectively retreat. You know, sometimes you pulled a rabbit out of the hat at the last minute. Sometimes, to be honest, probably the account man came up with a headline and everybody pretended to hate it until they admitted it was quite good. But <laughs> we've got to, because we're now sold by the hour and we have to satisfy procurement. We have to pretend mm. there's this linear Henry Ford production line process to satisfy procurement that we're not completely mad. But actually, mm -hmm. in truth, my, my view is if you can get to an interesting idea, uh, get there any way you can. Who cares? Right. You know, there's a, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not like we're drowning in fantastic world changing ideas. So I don't think we should be too picky about how we arrive at them. Yeah. That is so true. This is so much fun. I just love listening to you and, and the crossword puzzle and the clues. And it, for me, it was like inductive reasoning, deductive, post-rationalization. I, I love it. So even Cheryl creativity, Thomas. Creativity, by the way, creativity is actually the third one, which is you have, I can never remember what de, what's the difference between deduction and induction. But the third one is called abductive inference, which does require a leap of imagination. Yeah. And this was an American philosopher called Charles Sanders Peirce. Um, and he was introduced to me by this guy, uh, Roger L. Martin, who's a very, very good business writer, um, wrote a very good book called When More Is Not Better. And mm. um, Martin's a big fan of, of Peirce. <clears throat> and um, Peirce was one of these people, a bit like Torsten Veblen, who was a complete genius, but his private life was so chaotic. You know, he never quite progressed in academia because he was always involved in some scandal or disgrace or whatever. But he was nonetheless right. He said that actually you can't get to anything significantly original simply through induction and deduction. You have to have kind of hypothesis and then test, instinctive hypothesis and then test it. 
you know, and it, it's um, he, he makes this point that there's this attempt, I think, by some people who think they're being scientific purists to effectively try and construct imagination free progress. And I, I genuinely I, I think it's a fundamental philosophical mistake. I don't think the data you'll never come up with something significantly new by looking at the data we already have, because as I famously said, you know, all the time, all big data comes from the same place, the past. And there was no data in 19. Uh, 80. I I'm still old enough to remember America pre-Starbucks, by the way, just. I think I first went to the US in 93. <clears throat> and about two years later, I was in New York and people said, there's this place where you can get coffee. Ooh, right? <laughs> now, <laughs> okay. Now, nobody in 1993 was wandering around going, why can't I spend $4 on a cup of coffee and wander around carrying it in a cup? Okay. You know, before Dyson, there was nobody going, I, I wish there was a $500 or $700 vacuum cleaner. The trouble with vacuum cleaners is they're just too cheap. You know, Red Bull. I, and I make the point that virtually every single, I mean, even, I'm even old enough to do this. I can remember a time when nearly everybody said mobile phones were a stupid idea. I mean, I mean literally. Okay. And I, okay, it's impossible for anybody under 40 to remember this, I guess, or under 50 even, perhaps. But I can literally remember when people said, you know, I, I, I used a mobile phone on Oxford Street in London in 1989 and people shouted abuse at me from passing cars. OK. And, so, and this is interesting, by the way, because one of the most important things I don't think advertising knows, and I think it's one of the reasons why big companies find it hard to innovate in a way, is I'd like to know what, how long Wordle was going for before it tipped into the mainstream. Because yeah. nearly all... Nearly all new product adoption is this kind of sigmoid curve. It's very slow, then it's very fast. And I think there's a big mistake we make at the moment in advertising is that we, we tend to justify advertising spend by the rate of growth of sales. But that might mean we're advertising too late when social proof and social contagion is already doing a lot of the work of spreading the idea. Arguably, the time to advertise is actually when it looks as though your advertising isn't paying off because what you're doing is seeding the first users in that marketplace and mm. speeding up, steepening that curve. And yeah, it's, mm. it's just an interesting question to me because we see it now, I think, with electric cars, don't we? Okay. Yeah. Which was, you know, it was a very, okay, it was Tesla only for a long time. I mean, Tesla was a super niche product as recently as what, four, four years ago, five years ago, certainly. Okay. It was a high, really, really niche product. And now I think, now I don't know the answer to this question. People are saying, well, you know, what's the rate of transition to electric cars? And I kind of go, well, there's only one question you need to know. How many people who buy an electric car go back to an internal combustion engine? That's true. Because that, that's the real question. to ask. Is this a sticky technology where nobody wants it? Nobody wanted the mobile phone, right? Nobody wants the electric car. Or the majority of people are going on about range anxiety and going on about, you know, cold weather, you know, cold weather range and so on. Perfectly fair objections. But nonetheless, my hunch is that everybody who buys an electric car will find it difficult to go back to a gasoline one. Partly yeah. all well, sorts of things. But there's the tech, there's the smoothness, the torque, all that kind of stuff. The fact that actually once, when you first have an electric car, you are quite anxious, but you, that anxiety actually dissipates fairly quickly mm -hmm. and you become a convert. But I mean, that's the interesting question with Wordle. Is it one of those things like second life? Because it always slightly baffles. When you're old, there is the terrible problem when you're 56, which is you do go, I've kind of seen this shit before. And everybody's talking about the <laughs> metaverse. Okay. Everyone's going on and on about the metaverse. Okay. Yeah. And I kind of go, well, we had this craze about Second Life, and it was for about a month the most massive thing online. And now I imagine it's like one of those Chinese cities, you know, where there are massive great constructions with nobody living there. Okay, and I'm kind of, and, and a bit of me, and I know, you know, I know this sounds a bit luddite, okay, but I kind of go, why are we talking about the metaverse when we could be talking about Zoom, okay? <laughs> because the huge explosion in video conferencing strikes me as highly significant in terms of productivity, the nature of work, uh, flexibility okay. of work, all this kind of thing, okay? You know, we can actually reinvent our business processes, we can reinvent who we work with, we can bring in external experts much more easily. We can change the way we do business through Zoom. And I said, you know, yeah. Ogilvy used to be a handshaking business, and now we're a broadcasting business. You know, we need to get used to it. But for some reason, you can't talk about Zoom because it makes you look a bit of a, a bit of an oldie. So everybody's talking about the metaverse. But 
how would our conversation now be improved, right? If we were both weird, exaggerated avatars of ourselves and that we had <laughs> exaggerated and slightly implausible bodily movements, right? I mean, would it would it genuinely improve this conversation? You know, if I had a slightly strange robotic head and moved my arms in ridiculous ways, I, I don't see how that would make this any better, really. And so... I, I do worry about that, which is there's this futurology thing where everybody's got to talk about something that's five years out. To be honest, I think we've got enough technology where we could reasonably place a moratorium on all technological development and say, we're going to spend the next six years working out how to do the best with what we've already got. You know, because, you know, there were technologies like video conferencing, which until the pandemic just sat there in the background, right, being ludicrously underused, in my opinion. You know, it's, it's pretty significant, the fact that you can hold a meeting with people in five continents, um, you know, at a day's notice, uh, with zero travel cost, very low carbon emissions compared to the alternative. Um, and that I always said, you know, one of the things I'm interested in is, I said, you know, why don't we just, in the old world, if you had to go into the office, you couldn't really get an expert in from Amsterdam or New York. But now I, I always say with local people, look, why don't, why don't we get two people in who know a huge amount about this subject and pay them a thousand dollars just to talk to us, right? <laughs> you know, and, um, and, and, you know, we couldn't do that in the old world because it meant effectively, you know, that was, that was a day out of their life. If you had to mm -hmm. travel to an office to have the conversation. Well, now the opportunity cost of a one hour zoom call is pretty trivial, really. Exactly. And I, I, I think this is a much more important technology. I think the only reason people aren't talking about it is that because it's 12 years old, it doesn't make you look clever. But then most technologies take about 30 years before they reach real productivity significance. Um, there's a great paper about electric motors, which is when they used electric motors to replace steam, steam engines, there was virtually no improvement in anything. It was only when they realized you could have a factory with lots of little motors and turn them off and on, rather than having one massive steam engine operating the whole thing. That was when you got the 1920s productivity boom. Wow. And I think, you know, I think, I think a lot of technologies are like that. You, you, you invent the thing, you go through the hype cycle, and then eventually 10, 15, 20 years later, or maybe after a pandemic, people finally learn how to use them properly. Um, <laughs> I love that. There, there's this one. Um, there's this one BuzzFeed article. You remember the little Pez candies and yeah. how we would unwrap them and then we'd individually put in the little candy tablets in there. And then this three. There's an article that says you've been doing it wrong the entire time. You actually just supposed to take the Pez candy, put it in there, and it will automatically rip off the wrapper for you. And I was like. I've been doing it wrong this entire time. That that actually fascinates me, those blind spots. Do you know how monkeys actually open a banana? It's really interesting. So all Isn't humans from the other end? All humans, they do it from the other end. They squeeze the pointy end. They don't snap the stalk. They squeeze the pointy end of the uh, uh, of the banana between two fingers and it pops open from that end. Yeah. So I mean monkeys, I think, have more experience doing that than humans do. So it's True. very strange how some, you know, how just norms of behavior get established. And, and also right. blind, blind, blind spots, as you say. I mean, there are yeah. certain things where, um, you know, I, uh, there was some <laughs> wonderful blind spot, which when you think about it makes perfect sense. Someone admitted on the internet, albeit anonymously. And bear in mind, they were about 30 years old, that for 30 years, they only cleaned the front of their teeth, okay? They hadn't cleaned the back of the teeth or the or the or the surface of their teeth. They just cleaned the front because every photograph of someone cleaning their teeth in advertising or marketing shows that it doesn't show someone going like that. It shows someone <laughs> basically cleaning the front. And this guy admitted that for thirty years it had never occurred to him that you actually had to clean the back of your teeth as well as the front. And it is possible to go through life with these really weird. I used to do something. I have to admit this is slightly embarrassing. <laughs> But, but I'm not very, I'm not frightened of flying, never occurred to me to be frightened of flying. And I didn't really notice until I started flying on business. And if you fly on business, of course, there are a lot of people in business class who don't want to be flying, but their boss has made them fly or they have to fly on business. And I started noticing that about 25, 30% of people around me were on takeoff, were really scared. They were holding on to the armrests and doing things like this. Now, for a few years, I used to download programs from television, kind of from the British equivalent of TiVo to my laptop 
to watch on a plane, okay? And I sit there with this sort of 15 inch laptop screen, sitting back with headphones on, flight, okay? And I used to watch air crash investigation, <laughs> okay? <laughs> <laughs> why, would you do, why would you do that <laughs> I, I downloaded like i enjoy air crash investigation i'm not frightened of flying so i wasn't thinking i'm on a plane but it suddenly occurred to me the people looking over my shoulder if they're frightened of flying seeing like an animation of a 737 plowing into a mountainside at 500 miles an hour <laughs> it's lovely because one one of the reasons for diversity and i mean diversity in everything okay it isn't just that it, it, it actually gives you complementary um, views on the world, uh, which is valuable. It's particularly valuable in advertising, having a diverse group of people. It's also that it closes down blind spots. That if you get a homogeneous group of people, this is what to some extent happens with things like the financial crash, okay? You get a group of people all from the same background who all think in exactly the same way. And what that does is it leaves them completely blind to things outside their kind of framework or model of the universe. And so, you know, one of, one of the most important things, I think, is comedians do it wonderfully, is just noticing things. You know, the great, the great talent, I think, with advertising is just curiosity and observation, which is you look at things with a slight, just that tiny bit of detachment, which means that you see things that everybody else just didn't notice because they were always there. And it does require you to look at life a little bit through the eyes of a slight alien or, you know, a recent arrival to planet Earth. Um, I suppose it's doing anthropology on your own people. You know, that's yeah. effectively, the, you know, you have the mindset of an anthropologist. And, you know, when you look at when you detach it, uh, you know, the behavior of you know, conventional Western wealthy people um, is really quite strange if you write it in anthropological language. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, our obsession, I think our obsession with higher education and the fact, I mean, you probably, your listeners will have heard Scott Galloway and various people talk about this, where higher education has actually become a branch of the luxury goods industry, mm. where it's a deliberately scarcified commodity that's insanely expensive, that effectively awards you with credentials to then apply for remunerative employment. OK, so th this is, I, I think, Scott Galloway, this guy called Brian Kaplan, who's saying that effectively, you know, the Ivy League universities have kind of become like a kind of Louis Vuitton. You know, it's effectively a, it's, it's a Veblen good. Yeah. Um, and it, and I, I think I think that ability to see things just obliquely, you know, that n that things are not necessarily what they're ostensibly for. Things are not necessarily doing the function that we ostensibly think they do, mm -hmm. I think is really important. You know, cleaning teeth, by the way, is a great example of that, which is if you ask people why they clean their teeth, they can talk about cavities. They talk about, you know, enamel, dental health, um, avoiding plaque, avoiding tartar, all those things. OK, if you look at when people clean their teeth, logically, they should clean their teeth after a meal, but they don't. They clean first thing in the morning and before you go out in the evening. And what you realize is people are cleaning their teeth for the confidence of fresh breath far more than they are for long-term dental health. And, you know, if you think about it, 98% of the world's toothpaste is flavored with mint. Now, if it were really about the, the mint doesn't contribute to dental health, right? It just makes your mouth feel fresh and gives you the confident feeling that you, you know, your breath probably isn't rank. But I think, I think you know, there, there's the official reason we do things. And then there's the deeper psychological reason. And I think uncovering the way it's that's why it's like a cryptic crossword, because you have the surface meaning of the clue and then you have what the clue is really telling you. And I think mm. there's there's nearly always something going on beneath the surface, which you have to uncover in that kind of marketing crossword game. You know, you know, what 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 is it? You know, OK, everybody's claiming, you know, I always joke about this when I said, you know, if you do a new business pitch, everybody thinks that what the, the client is thinking is, I hope this is a really good campaign which will sell a lot of my product, okay? Now, the truth is they would say that's what they're thinking too. They're not. They're thinking, how am I gonna show this to my boss and will it make me look stupid? <laughs> okay, right? True. And so understanding that there's always a kind of undercurrent going on. And by the way, I mean, you know, I think advertising and marketing gets this wrong because we spend all our time adding positives to things when we should probably get a better return sometimes from re removing negatives. You know, mm -hmm. what is it, you know, what is it that makes people feel uneasy about doing something different? 
I, I've always said, you know, one of the magical brand properties of Coke is that you can ask for a Coke anywhere on earth without looking weird. Okay. That's true. So, you know, you can go to a beach shack in Jamaica, you can go to a Michelin starred restaurant in, in Paris, and you can ask for a Coke or diet, or actually in Paris, you'd ask for a Coca light for some reason. Okay. And you can ask for a Coke and they're expected to provide it. If they haven't got it, it's their fault. Right. Okay. Right. You know, it, it's actually an obligation for any establishment yeah. to provide you. Now that's not true of Dr. Pepper, is it? Except in no. Texas and New Mexico. Okay. Uh, but, but, you know, I can't go to a Paris restaurant. If I asked, went to a Michelin star restaurant and said, oh, I think I'll have a Dr. Pepper, um, Monsieur Le Dr. Pepper, of course it would be. Um, no, they wouldn't, um, uh, you know, uh, not only would they not have it, they'd treat me as an idiot for asking. But, yeah, I've so had that awful, experience before. <laughs> an awful, are you a Dr. Pepper drinker? Are you? Are you no, all, no, no, I, no. So I'm, I'm from California and I remember I yeah. went to New York. I was invited out to brunch and I was going to have an omelet. And I remember asking the waiter if I could have salsa mm. to go with my omelet. Next thing I know, the waiter comes back with this fizzing water. And I'm like, what is this? Oh, seltzer. This isn't... It's yes, he gave seltzer. me seltzer. And oh, I was like, seltzer? No, I wanted salsa. And everyone looked at me like, you're not from New York. And I was like, no, I'm from California where I eat tacos. <laughs> oh, I see. Actually, I mean, I'm going to really have scandalize half your listeners here. The food in California is now better than the food in New York, isn't it? Is that fair? Oh, goodness. I, w I wouldn't even go. Th I don't know. I, it's been a while since I've been in New York, to be very honest with you. Yeah, no. I th but I mean, I, I've been repeatedly amazed, actually, the California food and wine scene. And the other thing that's extraordinary is the American beer scene, where, I mean, the US has gone from one of the worst countries in the world to drink beer to probably the best in the space of about 10 years. I mean, I mean, the whole innovation in food and drink is really, really interesting because, again, none of it comes from this asking people what they want. It's all yeah. kind of weird fanatics persevering with some sort of dream. Got it. And you know, no, no one, no one would have predicted that the hoppy IPA, okay, yeah. albeit, <laughs> albeit a bit colder than we drink it in the UK, okay, yeah. but that's exactly like Monty Python. Monty Python, uh, you, you know Monty Python, right? Um, I met John Cleese and they said straight up, they said, OK, we're going to try and export this humor, but let's forget about the United States completely. There's no way this is going to play in the US. Yeah. OK, and they, they, you know, they didn't even bother to go. And of course, there was one Dallas PBS station that picked it up and started showing it. And it went it went down massively in Dallas. So there was some heroic guy running some sort of PBS local station. And then mm -hmm. it took off there and took off everywhere else. But I mean, so much, I think, I think there's a vital point here, which is so much about markets is actually probabilistic. Okay. Yeah. You, you, and I, th I think this is the great mistake with highly targeted media. The large part of media should be, we don't know who our customers are, so we're going to try and find out by making a lot of noise. Okay. <laughs> because you generally can't define customers with the neat demographics other than past customers, which is a bit binary, okay? You can't define them with some neat demographic thing. It's never, when you look at real world data, it's never that neat, really. And mm -hmm. so I think, I think what happens, I think this is a fundamental way in which we get the world wrong, which is in the event, one possible version of the future played out between 2018, say, and 2020, or 2020 and 2022, okay? Mm -hmm. And because we find it very easy to post rationalize and provide post hoc explanations for why the world went the way it was, it did. OK, we imagine it's equivalently easy to predict the future by extrapolating forwards in the same way. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is, as 20 as 2020 showed us fairly, I think, fairly <laughs> explicitly, you know, you, you're just one bat away from, you know, a totally different outcome. That's very and true. I, you know, and I think I think we always have this view that we look back at history and we effectively tease out all the strands and we make it look fairly deterministic and we make it look fairly sequential. And we go, OK, so this is how the world works, we say, yeah. looking back. So I can now deploy in mirror image, I can now deploy exactly those same talents to predict the future. And the truth of the matter is you really can't. I mean, yeah. you, you know, I mean, uh, it Wordle, who's, who predicted that? <laughs> 
That's true. And P.S. By the way, I am I'm giggling because I don't know if you see this, Rory, but Cheryl Thomas is in the audience and she's saying I'm cackling. And then we also have Gabe Leal who's saying, Stephanie, what is that pink book behind you? Great placement. And now I'm curious, which is actually a really great transition because Rory, let's talk about the book for a moment. Yeah. Gabe. Yeah. Alchemy. <laughs> Gabe, if you want to, if, it's called Alchemy and it's um, yeah. it's on sale now on, on Amazon and uh, many other bookshops. Um, and it's about this point that we're in denial about the fact, even marketers are in denial about the fact that value is actually psychologically determined and that you can make something valuable. You can make something more enjoyable, more appreciated. Uh, you can charge a greater price for it, not by changing the thing itself objectively, but by changing the way it's described, the, what, the name it has, um, the, uh, the competitive frame you place it in, the context you describe it in, and that value is actually a product of human perception and human perception isn't objective. And so it's a complete mistake. And I think even marketers do this. We've, we've bought this kind of neoliberal economic idea that value is created in the factory. And the only thing you can do to create value is to make a product better or to reduce the price. That's the only way you can make it better for a consumer. But you can actually you can actually create value out of nowhere by giving the thing a new name. You can um, describe it in a new way. You can price it differently. You can charge for it differently. And even though the economics and the objective reality remain completely unchanged, the addition of psychological components to the communication context effectively that changes what we perceive what we perceive then when we perceive something differently our emotion it, it, the meaning changes when the meaning changes our emotional response changes and when our emotional response changes our behavior changes and that actually means that the, it isn't just objective reality behavior okay and attempts to kind of model that using you know ai or machine learning are doomed because between the objective reality and the behavior, there's the black box of human perception and emotional reaction, which is susceptible, I mean, to uh, all kinds, uh, okay, Red Bull, okay, terrible drink, tastes awful, cost a fortune, comes in a tiny can, but you promote it as medicinal or psychoactive, okay, and suddenly those very things that were a downside become a virtue. You know, high-end goods, you know, scarcity, high prices are sometimes actually a really clever marketing ploy um now in in conventional economics this would be a nonsense because a thing has a given utility in putting the price up uh, effectively uh, you know reduces its appeal um no that isn't necessarily true many many products champagne would be a good example mm -hmm. their main function is to signal generosity hospitality or to mark a special occasion and so cheap champagne in a sense is a bit of a mistake because yeah. it's not doing its job. Um, that, that was true of the Peloton, I think. The Peloton was actually became much more popular when they put the price up significantly. And yeah. so this, this business that, that what we buy is what something means, we don't buy what something is. Um, and therefore, the meaning of something is a function of how it's described, how it's framed, um, uh, how it's prom prom promoted and presented, every bit as much as what it actually is. Yeah. I think it's just it, it's incredibly important because I'll give you a lovely example of this. Right. We had a debate on Twitter yesterday, which is how differently would people drive if car speedometers didn't say miles per hour? They said minutes per 10 miles. OK. Oh, right. Interesting. Yeah. So you reverse it. You reverse time and uh, t uh, effectively instead of speed being um, distance over time, you make it effectively time for a given distance. Now, objectively, those things are completely identical, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can have the same dip, but we'd, we'd, we'd accelerate less or more. We'd drive. So, I mean, a classic example of this is in miles per gallon, which is how we in Britain and you in the United States um, describe fuel economy. In continental Europe, they call it, they do liters per hundred kilometers. And the argument various environmentalists have made is that liters per 100 kilometers is a much better measure of fuel economy because we tend to think that going from 50 miles per gallon to 60 is a really big deal because that's 10. That's 10 more, right? Mm -hmm. But actually, it's only a 20% improvement in fuel economy. 
Whereas going from 12 miles to, gap, to the gallon to 20, which is only eight, okay, that's actually a monumental, it's a 66% improvement in fuel economy, okay? And so what's interesting is that even when you are giving literally scientific information in a form which is, uh, you know, ap they're absolutely identical, one can be derived absolutely straight away from the other, uh, the way we'll respond to that format um, is driven by how it's presented. It's not driven by what it is. And I, I found that just really, really interesting because it basically says that we can't, I mean, there were early experiments with this in behavioral economics, you know, that mm -hmm. if you if you ask people to make a medical decision and you said 5% of the patients will die, you got a different outcome to when you said 95% of the patients will survive. Mm -hmm. And so we don't even respond to information in a context-free way. It, it's a really, really basic information. Interesting. And so, so, so this idea that marketing is a kind of added extra is, is nonsensical. The idea that it's a kind of magic fairy dust you add on top of the real value which is created in the factory, that's wrong. That actually everything is effectively appraised through the lens of human perception. And so... You know, you're doing marketing whether you like it or not. Yeah. <laughs> Effectively, <laughs> it is. It isn't objective reality plus a bit of glitz. Okay. Effectively, everything will be appraised according to how it's presented, even if you think you're not doing marketing at all. Yeah. Wow. I, I just I, I find it really interesting. I also like it. I mean, particularly because you've got a small agency audience. I really mm -hmm. like the behavioural science angle because it's scalable. Yeah. You know, the, the thing that slightly annoyed me about big agency life, it was kind of like, well, if you've got $10 million to spend, we can come and help you out. But otherwise, you know, we're not really interested. And actually, you can deploy creativity and insight just as valuably, more valuably, perhaps, um, with smaller businesses than you can with large ones. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, I, find, I find that when you work with smaller businesses, they're, they're more open to experimenting and testing things, whereas yeah, yeah. bigger agencies, it, it, like you said earlier, it's, it's data driven. You have to prove it and all these things and ROI. And with with smaller clients, smaller budgets, sometimes you they'll know, try you it. Have it. Yeah, try it and come back and so, tell me how it works out. <laughs> so there are a few there are a few things which I, I love talking about, which is cafe marketing. And one of the arguments I make is, even if it's raining, put your chairs out on the pavement on, on the sidewalk in front of the cafe okay and the reason is the chairs aren't really furniture they're an advertisement because from 200 yards away if you see chairs out on a sidewalk you know there's a cafe there and you know it's open because if it wasn't Slight. open they would have put the chairs away okay so it's always understanding that ostensibly your chairs in a terrace in front of a cafe might be to provide seating and so you go well no point in putting these out it's pouring with rain Mm -hmm. But actually, your chairs are really doing the job of advertising the fact that there's an open restaurant or cafe from a distance of 400 yards or to fast moving traffic or whatever else. There's an agency right now that's managing a cafe and they just heard that tidbit. They're like, I am going to present this in my next meeting. No. <laughs> I'll, I'll, you just I'll blew you their one. minds. I'll give you a lovely one, which is that um, uh, I, I, um, I always... Um, I said something about this, about the ch tables and chairs, and somebody came to me and said, we know you're right. And I said, how? He said, you literally tested it. You put chairs out and you you measured the footfall. They said, no, we did the opposite. Said, what do you mean? Said, well, we didn't own the cafe. We were working in the cafe. And we always wanted a knockoff quite early. Okay. So what we really hated was when someone came in to the cafe 10 minutes before closing time, meant we had to serve them a coffee. They might have wanted a second coffee, so we couldn't start cleaning the espresso machine, okay? And they'd be sitting around, and now we couldn't clean up the cafe. We could, you know, effectively, we were going to go home at 5.30 rather than 5 o'clock. You know, it would delay us getting home. So they said, we discovered a really interesting trick. They said, all you had to do when the cafe was empty at, let's say, quarter, 15 minutes before closing time, if you put one chair upside down on top of another chair, nobody ever came in. It was just a signal that basically we're closing now, so forget about it. <laughs> okay, all you had to do. Now, the, interestingly, your boss couldn't really bollock you for this because you could say, oh, no, I needed to sweep the floor. But it was an unconscious signal, basically, don't come into our cafe. 
Yeah. And so all you had to do was take one of the outdoor chairs, put it upside down on top of another chair, or put a chair upside down on a table. That was it. No more customers for the day. See, that, that that's what I need to do at home. I'd be like, okay, the yeah. kitchen is closed. The snacks, the pantries, th th that's it. We are done. It's closed. We are it's done. Right, we're done. <laughs> so, I love, I love this so much so much of this is we we operate to so much such an extent through inference just by you know unconscious interpretation of signals and mm -hmm. you can un, you can unconsciously give away completely the wrong signal i've always said the worst thing you can do in a shop is allow people in and then when they try and buy something say sorry we're closed yeah the best thing you can do is is lock the door of the shop wait for someone to come along and try the door and when they do open make a big show of unlocking the shop and saying i was actually closing but why don't you come in and the reason is that regardless of the closing time of the shop and all that stuff the first is interpreted as an insult i bet if i looked more important i were more attractive if i was a hollywood megastar you would have you would have told me this thing but you're just being awkward because it's little old me and the second one where you actually open a door for someone deliberately is viewed as a massive compliment Mm. And we, we, we you know, we, we don't interpret this. We don't interpret this to do with opening hours. Nothing to do with that. It's all to do with interpersonal emotional response. I mean, I, I, I've got, by the way, any small business there, I've got a really simple idea. I'm absolutely convinced. And I've never got anybody to test it. That if you had a call center and you offer the chance of a call back to people who are waiting online. So you just say, press one and we'll call you back in the next 30 minutes. Okay. My hunch is that you'll find it much easier to cross sell those people, much easier to satisfy their complaints, because when a company calls us, it's kind of flattering. We feel like a customer. And when we're made to hold on a phone call, we feel like a supplicant. You know, we're like, mm -hmm. kind of, I am begging you for some of my attention. And it fundamentally, I think, perverts the customer seller relationship when you make someone wait to buy. Mm hmm. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm, I'm always intrigued. I mean, OK, let's look at other service businesses. One of the cleverest things which they were too slow to instigate are these McDonald's ter terminals where you order on a screen. OK, and I think there's a really big psychological thing going on there with the screens in McDonald's, which is that waiting to order is five times as annoying as waiting for your food to be prepared. Because we see the wait between inputting our order on the screen and getting the burger as that's them working for me, adding quality to the production of my burger. Whereas being made to queue before you can tell someone what you want is just five times as annoying per minute. Because it's a different, <laughs> although, although the duration is the same, it's a different yeah. kind of time. It's like yeah. waiting for an Uber. Waiting for an Uber is much more painless because you've got the map. I always yes. give this example. You know, because yeah. a logical person would say we need to increase the speed at which taxis turn up. So we're going to have a predictive algorithm, which means that taxis are hovering around in areas where we expect high demand. Now, Uber actually cracked that problem psychologically by just going, if you can see where your taxi is, you're not that bothered. You know, you go, oh, look, he's stuck at those traffic lights. I'll have another pint. You know, it's not yeah. a problem. Whereas if yeah. you don't know where your taxi is, you're in a state of tenterhooks for the same period. Yeah. Whoa. Like what's going on? Yeah, and there's I lots of this, this in alchemy. Basically, how you can check, how you can give people the same thing, but make them think about it completely differently. Yes, and so Gabe and Cheryl, who are tuning in, I'm telling you, you need to go ahead and check it out. Now, Rory, as a marketing agency, when we have the responsibility in creating a new campaign for a client, how do you recommend that most creative directors approach the challenge? and not depend too much on logic. Like what's your approach to that? What do you do? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think, uh, to be honest, I use behavioral science as a gateway drug to creativity, which is there's always the danger that the, there's that all good creative work in, in, involves some sort of leap, okay? You know, it, uh, there, there probably are a few exceptions where you can just use absolutely clear inductive logic. But usually there has to be some leap, some sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, effectively, a, you know, an imaginative leap of some kind. I, I guess you call it an inductive inference. OK, if you are if you're being scientific about it. And it's very difficult for someone in a very deterministic business. And, and, and by the way, we've got to remember this. OK, when I started in advertising, two thirds of ad spend was packaged goods. It was P&G. It was Unilever. It was Reckitt's, you know, OK. 
And those are marketing companies. You know, the chief executives worked in marketing. Marketing is a you know major part of the board composition, etc. That's now below 25 percent. And what's taken up the slack tends to be finance companies, tech companies. Um, it's uh, you know cable providers, broadband providers, mobile phone network operators. It's people from a kind of engineering and finance background who are much more reductionist and deterministic about their approach to things. Okay, you know, I, I mean, you know, beer marketers were always hyper indulgent because they recognised the product was consumed for fun <laughs> and that you know there weren't really any metrics you could start talking about. So you know, they accepted the fact that beer advertising was kind of a form of entertainment. You know, it was to some extent a kind of form of entertainment that was complementary to the product. But now, increasingly, of course, we have a client base from business categories which are much, much more kind of engineering focused or economics focused. And they tend to see that slight randomness of the leap as being indulgent. OK, it's a kind of self-indulgence. Because if this, you know, you're cheating here because, you know, I, you know, I can't, you know, I can't work out your thinking. So you've clearly just come up with this at random. And what you can do is you can use behavioral science because nearly, nearly all really great advertising end lines, you know, just add an egg, you know, all those things going back 50 years, reassuringly expensive, uh, you know, with a name like Smuckers, we have to make good jam, etc. Nearly all of them can be explained <laughs> as why they're clever in using the language and tools of behavioral science. And there's probably an, actually an academic name for them. So the great thing is you can, by explaining the fact that our job is to appeal to system one rather than system two, mm -hmm. you, you can, particularly if you call it behavioral economics, I mean, behavioral economics, to be honest, is a rebranding of psychology. But the simple <laughs> fact was that government never took, you can't go to the president of the United States and say, I've got a guy here to talk to you about psychology. Okay. You know, the president of the United States can't have a council of psychological advisors as he has a council of economic advisors. But if you mm -hmm. call it behavioral economics, you get into places where you previously weren't admitted. And Daniel yeah. Kahneman, I think, who won the Nobel Prize for economics, after all, is always really pissed off about this. Why do we have to call ourselves behavioral economics before anybody took us seriously? And um, but I think I think there is in behavioral science two things. I think one by asking much broader questions about how you define the problem in the first place, you expand the possible solution space for creativity. You know, mm. you can look at really, really, you know, you define if you define a behavioral objective and then ask what might the interventions be that would trigger this behavior. Yeah, you you end up with a very, very large potential area to explore creatively. And, and that's good. Because expanding yeah. the potential for creatives. I talked to a guy in the States and it was all about how do we get people to install more than one smoke detector? Fire departments would send people around and they'd give away free smoke detectors, typically in kind of low income areas. And the mm -hmm. people would always take one, but they'd only take one. And the fire guy would say, well, really, you need three. OK, mm. you, you need you need three. You need one in the child's bedroom, one in the hallway, one in the kitchen, perhaps. OK. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, I'm just having one. And we never knew why that was. And I, I still don't know why it was. And then eventually, by I said, I know what the answer is. You turn up with six. OK. And you say, <laughs> you know, normally I'd install five in an apartment this size. But here I think you can make do with three. OK. <laughs> now, if you turn up with six smoke detectors, they may bargain you down to four or three. But they're certainly not going to bargain you down to one. OK. Because if a guy's turned up with six smoke detectors saying, no, I only want one, is ridiculous. He's going to meet you halfway. That's the Cinderella effect. And he's going to, the, the, the person in the, the tenant's going to go, well, how about three? Yeah, OK, fine. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> and they were always turning up with three, which meant they had nowhere, they had nowhere to go but down. Yeah. And so I, I always got that insight from comedy. You know, you know why don't we turn up with a hundred of them and start sticking them on every wall and then <laughs> get them to remove the smoke detectors they didn't want and you'd probably end up with four or five um but but i, I found it really interesting because you've expanded the solution base and then when you've come up with a creative leap you can kind of then reverse engineer how you got there in a way that, that they find satisfying i love that you know, in oh other words the the, the 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 psychological insight that drives this is such and such you know we had a wonderful thing with kfc in australia uh they give away um 
they call them chips, as we do in Britain, you call them fries. They give away chips for a dollar, Australian dollar, okay? And the most successful way to sell these was weirdly the headline, which came from the legal copy, maximum four per customer. <laughs> okay. Oh. Now, when you think about it, putting, if you, if you go to, a, that is a completely counterintuitive thing to do, isn't it? Okay, we're trying to sell these dollar um, fries for a dollar. And you, what you're doing is you're actually emphasizing the fact that you can't buy too many of them. Okay, mm -hmm. why on earth would that work? Now, fortunately, in behavioral science, there's a whole thing called, you know, scarcity bias, which is we want things that we can't have, or that our perceived value of something is heightened if we think that thing is in limited supply. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now, if it's maximum four per customer, I feel I'm missing out if I only have one. Yeah. Now, the vital thing about behavioral science is quite often these insights are a bit counterintuitive. As I put it, you know, the opposite of a good idea is often another good idea. This isn't like physics where the, you know, the opposite of a, of a fact is a falsehood. OK, mm -hmm. this is actually, you know, in Niels Bohr always said this, you know, uh, in, in, you know, the opposite of a fact is a falsehood, but the opposite of a, of a big concept is of a big idea is possibly another big idea. Mm -hmm. um, and quite often, the thing you propose doing in behavioral science is quite counterintuitive. It seems to, a, to the economic mindset, it seems completely irrational. And so you need to have this body of work that says, well, actually, you know, this is how we've evolved to respond to information yeah that's fascinating gabe leo is in the comments and he's saying rory is dropping some amazing knowledge and wisdom and so for those of you that are just tuning in throughout this conversation we've been talking about the importance of creative illogical ideas and how to present them to agency clients now rory john cleese he suggested that we use our tortoise mind the slow cooking part no. of our subconscious to come up with creative ideas where else you might recommend that agencies come up with illogical solutions to today's marketing well, challenges, well, yeah? Part, part of it is, as I put it very simply, if there were a logical answer to many of the world's problems, we already would have found it, okay? There's no shortage of logical people, economists, who are allowed to run riot on solving these problems. And yet they're still problems, which suggests one of two things. Either they're impossible to solve, or the solution will be surprisingly, you know, surprisingly unexpected or oblique. Um, you know, I mean, you know, in a weird way, I mean, I've been fascinated by the adopt, as I said, the adoption of video conferencing, which I think is, you know, potentially quite important for the environment. Um, I don't understand why the government can tax people to pay for roads, but can't tax people to pay for Zoom, because surely the best <laughs> journey is one that you don't make. Okay. And I keep, mm. I kept arguing this. I think I said there's a perfectly good case for the Department for Transport in the UK to pay sort of, you know, $80 million, $100 million a month to Zoom to give everybody in Britain Zoom access. OK. And I said, you know, $100 million only pays for about eight miles of interstate. You know, it probably, you know. Now, surely the best thing the Ministry for Transport can do to improve the experience of our trains and roads is to have fewer people on those trains and roads making journeys that they don't want to make. Mm -hmm. uh, it's rather like the phrase in um, in car manufacturing, car design, the best part is no part, because no part can't go wrong. You know, you try and strip out complexity wherever you can. And, and it always strikes me as very interesting that when you go to a department of transport, a government department, and say, no, 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 actually, you should be investing in technology that mean people don't have to commute. Because yeah. now the quality of the, those people who do have to commute will enjoy a much better, a much pleasanter journey mm -hmm. um, because you've taken a certain number of people off the train. Or maybe people like me, as I quite often do, if I do go into the office, I don't go in at nine o'clock anymore. I never did, actually. <laughs> um, but no, but I, I don't even try to get in at nine o'clock anymore. I go in at kind of 10, 30, 11. You know, I, I do a bit of, you know, I do a Zoom call in the morning, do a bit of email, travel in when the trains are empty. And so the ability, it's always very interesting that I think there's a really important missed um, exercise in a lot of problem solving, which is creatively defining the problem and creatively opening up the space for a solution, which is it doesn't necessarily mean more trains, more roads, more cars. One solution is to stagger the time at which people make a journey, for example. That will have exactly the same effect at vastly lower cost. 
Um, and so, you know, I, I think there is a complete lack of uh, this talent for sort of what you might call reframing a problem, which, you know, quite a lot of fairly good thinkers have said, uh, Einstein famously said, if you gave me two days to solve a problem, um, uh, I'd spend, four, you know, I'd spend 47 and a half hours defining the problem and half an hour solving it or something like that. Um, and I think there is something where in an institutional setting, um, there's a very low risk of getting into trouble if you tackle a problem in a boringly logical way. Very true. It may not be very effective, but it looks like you're trying, okay? Mm -hmm. Because that's our official problem. I am fighting against the problem, and yep. therefore I'm clearly making a large effort to try and eliminate this problem. Now, the fact that you're not solving the problem and you could solve the problem much more easily by doing something slightly oblique or unexpected, um, that is true, but it's much riskier for your career because it's not mm -hmm. a good way of signaling. Some, I think, political movements do this, which is I, I want you to solve the problem, not signal that you care about it. And they're not necessarily the same thing. You know, to signal the fact that you're really upset by something is not the same as actually saying, how do we actually stop this happening? You know, I love that signaling versus solving. <laughs> well, no, I, I think I think that's a huge danger in, in both government and large businesses. It's not it's not a problem in family owned businesses. It's not a problem in, in uh, owner managed businesses because those people essentially um, their interests are very, very well aligned with the interests yeah. of the company because they are the company. They're yeah, aligned, exactly. Business. But there's this misalignment between, uh, John Maynard Keynes said, um, worldly wisdom teaches that it is often better for the reputation to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. <laughs> okay. And I think, I think there's this element where people who want to be seen to be trying and, and want to signal commitment often actually engage in fairly ineffective activities, fairly uncreative activities, as a result, because it's it, your career will never be harmed by trying hard and failing in many ways. Whereas if it's your own business, totally different equation. So Cheryl Thomas is in the in the comments. Cheryl, I'm so happy that you're here. She's saying, Rory, I feel like I have found an intellectual soulmate. Could be a generational thing. She's about to turn 50. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah get used to this. There'll be some really strange things when you turn 50. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You'll want to go go on holiday to places you've been before, okay? You know, all that sort of stuff will start happening. Don't worry. It's great, actually. <laughs> so then having said that, Rory, this has been an amazing interview. Thank you so much. I, I don't think I've ever smiled this much. I have pages and pages of notes. I was backstage with the producer. I was like, that was so good. <laughs> I'm like, let's just let him go. But Rory, honestly, can you tell folks where to connect with you and learn more? I'm sure Cheryl is just like, where do I find him? Yeah, uh, very simply, uh, any after sales service questions, um, Twitter, I'm at Rory Sutherland, all one word. Um, on LinkedIn, I'm Rory Sutherland at Ogilvy. There we go. My Twitter, my Twitter feed's up there already. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, and all, all, obviously, you can buy my book, although, you know, no need to plug that. I've also written a more recent book, uh, co-written with Pete Dyson, on the behavioral science of transport which is the whole idea, which is that transport is dominated by engineers who measure things they can quantify. And yet passengers don't really care about those things to the extent that engineers think they should. Uh, you know, Ooh. it's that whole thing that actually, uh, you know, um, knowing where your taxi is is actually more important than the, how quickly it turns up, that kind of thing. Um, and I, it's a classic case, I think, transport, because it's dominated by an engineering mindset, which is kind of reductionist and deterministic and mm -hmm. actually it, that mindset sits very badly i think or fi it finds itself really discomforted by psychological solutions because if your status derives from your engineering excellence a, a there's a, okay there's a really famous story about this which is similar to the uber map which is a, a firm i think somewhere in the midwest where the elevators were really slow and they were going to go into Otis and basically spend half a million dollars speeding up the elevators, replacing the cables, beefing up the winding gear, strengthening the lift shafts at great expense. And a guy just said, no, 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 don't bother. He said, try this. Put floor to ceiling mirrors between the lift, the elevator doors on every floor. That's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Floor, floor to ceiling mirrors. And he said, he said, what they're really saying is the reason they're frustrated is not because the lifts are slow. It's because they get bored waiting for the lift. 
And if you give them an opportunity to look at something, i.e. themselves, while they're waiting for the lift, they'll be much, much happier. And sure enough, at a tiny fraction of the engineering solution, they put in the psychological solution, which was the mirrors, and all the complaints dried up. Now, I have no idea where that happened, so don't ask me for chapter and verse. <laughs> but it's a, very, it's a very famous story in the kind of annals of creative problem solving. I love it. Spotify, Spotify did it similarly, which is they were briefed to um, reduce as far as possible the lag before a song started after you clicked on it. And they reported back and said, we've got it down to 125 milliseconds or something like that, 129 milliseconds. So I said, can you do better than that? And they said, yeah. Well, why didn't you do better? They said, there's no point because the human brain can't really detect the difference between that and instantaneous. You know, so that, you know, there's no point in producing a screen at a higher resolution than the eye can actually determine, you know. And so as a result, you know, what they've done is they designed their solution around human perception rather than trying to optimize an SI unit, which is what engineers tend to do. I love this. I love this. Cheryl, you're probably geeking out as much as I do. <laughs> and so was Gabe. And honestly, friends, that's all that we have for today. I know it was so good, wasn't it? I was like, man, I, Rory, I could listen to you all day, every day. I want to stalk you on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, please do. Yeah. Yes, I, I really want to see that debate too that you were talking about earlier. So everyone, in our next episode, we'll be talking to Kevin Lau from Adobe about oh, the customer wow, experience. Really? Yeah, yeah, I know. And then right after we'll have David Fisher to help agencies better leverage LinkedIn for sales. That's going to be super important. And then our very own head of agency business for Agora Pulse, Teresa Anderson, is going to be joining the show as well. So remember, remember to leave our podcast a review on Apple or Spotify. We were just talking about Spotify. And let us know what you think. We would love to hear from you. And so Rory, again, thank you so much for your time. This has been an absolute blessing. I'm still laughing at the elevator example because I was like, I, I knew there was a reason why they did that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, friends. So I'll see you and you're reading into the next show. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. What a pleasure. Thanks. You're the best. Hang tight. Hang tight, Rory. <laughs> I'm still here. Good. We'll roll the credits and then we'll geek out some more. That was so much fun. Fantastic. Thank you, Stephanie. It was wonderful. Yeah. I was just reading a book called A Hundred Million Dollar Offers and they actually, they quoted you. Rory Sutherland, oh. CMO of Ogilvy Advertising. I mean, it had said, I have it in my Rome research. It says, any fool can sell a product by offering it for a discount. It takes great marketing to sell the same product for a premium. And that's yeah. where I remembered seeing the elevator example. And I was like, I know this. I know Rory said this. <laughs> it's, called, <coughs> it's called $100 million offer, is it? Mm -hmm. I, 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 might, I, might go, offer. I might go and yeah, get that now, actually. That rather appeals to me. I like that kind of book. Yeah, it's, uh, I have it on Kindle, but it's fascinating because he, he talks